see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. So, hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Marilyn Schlitz, who's uh, president and CEO of the Institute of Noetic Science. And we're going to be talking about how we can build a culture of empathy. So, Marilyn, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. This is fun. Yeah, it's great fun. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you and I um, uh, connected over through the uh, Ashoka Activating uh, Empathy Contest, and you had uh, proposed, uh, uh, you had a proposal there. I think it was called World Liter Literacy Project. World Literacy Project. Uh -huh. right. yeah. So, could you tell me a little bit about yourself and about that project? Sure. Um, where does one begin with a story, right? Um, let's see. That project actually was born out of the work of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which is about to be 40 years old, and was founded by one of the Apollo 14 astronauts, Edgar Mitchell. And Edgar essentially had kind of two epiphanies coming back from his historic walk on the moon. And, um, and one was a kind of deep pain, a sort of profound empathetic experience of the suffering on the planet and the recognition that when he looked down at this beautiful, pristine whole planet, it, it wasn't made up of divisions or um, territories or boundaries. It was really this unitive planet Earth in all its glory and suspended in the deepness of space. And, and so um, I guess the idea there was that the root cause of the suffering wasn't something out there and that in fact maybe the great scientific revolution isn't the exploration of outer space but really the exploration of inner space and the nature of the worldviews that form these divisive relationships. Uh, the second part of his epiphany was that um, he saw this unit of consciousness and again thinking about empathy he had this profound mystical type experience of non-dual, of no separation and, and and those two uh, factors really led him to come back to planet Earth and start the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And, and our work has been very much about this interface between science and inner knowing, the noetic, the direct knowing, and empathy is clearly a part of that. Um, just quickly, my own story, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan in the 60s and 70s, and it was a time of profound change and... and um, disarray. And uh, so I think in that process, I became very interested in transformation and how we could begin to shift the model of reality. But as a kid, one doesn't feel all that empowered to go out and do something. Uh, I thought about it. Uh, and then I discovered that I was actually a noetic scientist. I didn't you know, really have that language before, but I have committed my uh, career to really studying the interface between consciousness, our emotions, our worldviews, our belief systems, and how that relates to the physical world, whether it's through healing or uh, individual healing, social healing, uh, a variety of different topics. And so um, the Worldview Literacy Project then comes out of a decade-long study we did on consciousness transformation. So how is it that people can shift their perspectives and their worldviews? Um, there's certainly a lot of teachers out there who claim they can help you do that. We were interested in the qualities that they might share that could help the average person. And so we um, collected stories from 60 masters from different world traditions. And we then created a survey instrument and, and disseminated that to about 2,000 kind of average householders. And engaged in some longitudinal studies of consciousness transformation and worldview transformation. And then after that project kind of was completed with a book called Living Deeply, The Art and Science of Transformation, um, we, I was um, in a situation where my son was a Cub Scout and they had an about God requirement in the Scouts. And there was something about it that just didn't sit with my own metaphysic or how I wanted to expose my son to that concept of God. And, and so I asked the Scout leader if I could show him this DVD we had made of nine different masters doing different practices around worldview transformation and the cultivation of empathy and good relations, compassion. Um, and he said, that's great, but could you do it for the whole den? And I was like, okay, well, so I wrote letters to all the parents. And I asked them, um, 
uh, I wrote to the, all the parents and I asked them if um, it was okay because religion is something tender. And they all said fine. And one woman said, can I bring my, you know, my mother? And so we had three generations of people in the room talking about worldview and how we can open ourselves. And these young kids who were, you know, then 10 years old, um, watching their eyes open when they could see that common thread of humanity uh, that came when we were watching these di different teachers. So that then led to a project. Um, I did uh, another third grade class, and then a sixth grade teacher found out about it, and another sixth grade teacher. And it was really great, except for I do have a full-time job. And so I was thinking, wow, wouldn't it be wonderful to create a curriculum that you could bring these ideas to kids uh, in classrooms based on standards? And in walked a woman who has been one of our um, research associates and also one of our donors and she said it's time to bring worldview literacy to the public schools and it was like an idea was born there and we've since grown it we have uh, 18 formal lessons that are all about engaging worldview and what does it mean to have a worldview what does it mean that somebody else has a worldview different from yours um, can it change what are the skills we need in order to relate to one another and uh, and just to draw a conclusion to this riff, um, the uh, aspect of empathy becomes an important piece of all of that as we're uh, inviting that sense of relational being and recognizing that, you know, as we move rapidly into the 21st century, probably the most fundamental skill set we're going to need is understanding that, first of all, we don't see everything that shapes our experience. In fact, we don't see the vast majority of that. So as we can facilitate a skill set for young people where they can broaden their sense of knowing, they can uh, really begin to relate to others in that empathetic way that can, I think, ultimately shift you know, personal relationships, international relationships, transcendent relationships. So um, what I'm kind of looking at is how do we build a culture of empathy? So I've kind of like, you know, from kind of my search and my quest, and I followed the, uh, you know, your the work that you've done over the years as well. And from what I've kind of been finding is that empathy is kind of this central uh, value that uh, I think has been, you know, relatively ignored. There's a lot of interest really starting up in it. So I'm looking at how do we build a culture of empathy? You know, what are the steps that we can do towards building a culture of empathy? And it sounds like you have this curriculum that kind of facilitates uh, that, that uh, empathy building uh, process then. Yeah, I think so. I think that that's um, a part of what we're doing with worldview literacy. I think empathy is a, a kind of a fundamental skill set. Uh, I think it's worth unpacking what we mean by empathy and. Um, and also, you know, just a little bit about the Worldview Literacy Project. It's available to um, teachers, and we're actively recruiting teachers right now who want to participate in um, these 18 lessons. And there's a research component to it. So all of this is research-based or kind of evidence-based. And so we're collecting data pre and post with the students and the teachers uh, about the, the value of the curriculum. It's divided into three primary sections. It's sort of exploration of the first person. Um, my experience, what does it mean for my worldview, then it's the relational sense of uh, interpersonal and how is it that I can understand and begin to you know, see the world through another person's shoes as it were and we talk a lot about lenses, we actually have a map that the kids built and we're uh, actually doing a competition right now for the best poster that represents what this um, understanding of worldview represents. Uh, and then the third component to the curriculum is the sense of uh, em embodiedness in the world. And so how am I engaging in projects, in my community, in some kind of activity that can ultimately lead to something we can digitize and post on uh, the platform. And the platform is called Collaborize. Uh, and it's really great. It's a, a program that has been developed for teachers to share their work, share their curriculum, share assets, audio, video assets. And so we have a showroom set up there with the first five lessons. So people can come in and engage in the multimedia of it. Eventually, we see the program moving out into um, certainly a global outreach with students. That's the biggest vision we have for the educational piece and how you bring empathy into the world. I also think an important piece for strategy is, um, is the science 
and the research and how we're engaging this construct of empathy. Uh, we know that it's a feeling, and we also know that there are ways for us to begin to kind of conceptualize um, what I would like to think of as an integral approach to empathy. You know, thinking about it at multiple levels, um, there's that first person perspective, there's that sense of the interpersonal or cultural piece that we have, there's the science and that kind of um, analytical and um, objective, ostensibly objective uh, approach. And then there's the social institutions that it's all embedded in and how do we begin to affect those. So, um, yeah, I, I think that empathy is a very interesting topic and would love to just talk about some of those different facets because. Yeah. Um, yeah so you're looking at empathy from a lot of different points of view saying, well, here's empathy. We can look at it from a cognitive, scientific, a felt societal level. And and it's kind of like, I mean, there's even, even in, uh, you know, I've, I've looked at empathy, you know, so much, read so much about it. And even, you know, talk to the academics and the, and the scientists, and even they kind of look at it from a lot of different points of view. Like there's eight or 10 different kind of ways that it's used. And sometimes they don't agree and all that kind of stuff. But from, I could just share for a minute, um, my, you know, my synthesis of, of that. And I think it really follows what you've been uh, talking about here is, you know, the first part is kind of this self empathy. It's like mindfulness, sensory awareness, uh, what's going on in our own body. And as we become, you know, more aware of that, it kind of opens us up to allow for mirrored empathy through mirrored em mirror neurons. For example, as you just scratched your yourself, I could feel that scratch. I could feel that what that felt like through mirrored empathy, uh, and that's sometimes by the academics they call it the, uh, you know, persp not perspective, the emotional empathy or or emotional contagion, and so kind of words more around emotional felt. And then there's the uh, perspective, the scientists call it perspective taking, but I like the word imaginative empathy, which is kind of what I think you're talking about is like seeing the world from different points of view. If I put myself into someone else's situation, you know, what is the world, what would the look, world look like having their experience? So it's more of like this imaginative, uh, cognitive perspective taking. And then the fourth part is uh, empathic action which is, you know, once we start lining up these different uh, qualities kind of connecting with each other, that we actually take action uh, in the world and within society and sort of kind of redefine, re recreate our social structures. So that's a bit of a framework that kind of I've been seeing. And actually what you were talking about seems very similar to, yeah. to that, to that, uh, to that uh, process. I would add to it also there is this sense of the transpersonal in it and um, at the turn of the 19th century there was a French uh, psychophysiologist, Roche, and he was really looking at that sense of shared empathy that comes even at a distance or in a kind of, um, it was sort of the origins of the word telepathy was the the transfer of a deep feeling and knowing that oneness uh, with then somebody at a distance and even under uh, what Roche introduced was um, uh, the kind of mathematical probability to evaluate whether somebody was having a genuinely non-sensory experience as compared to the kind of mirror neuron activity that you were talking about where it's based on our physical relationship, me seeing. So it's part of the visual apparatus. It's one of those sensory connections. Or people talk about the more um, expanded senses where you think about entrainment that happens at the psychophysiological level. You see it in different cultures like in the the um, Kung Bushmen of the Kalahari where they dance and dance for days and they get into this resonant state where their bodies are entrained and so there's a psychophysiological thing. Um, and then I think that, you know, broader than that, this idea of telepathy is compelling because people have reported these experiences where um, they're really one with the other person and one with the experience. 
uh, Rache started with hypnosis and he was looking at when people get into these deep trance states, uh, are they able to have better empathy with somebody else even at a distance? Uh, the experiments were then, you know, obviously picked up in the in the later years and there were a whole series of experiments done uh, under the direction of a man named Chuck Honerton at the, um, in Princeton, New Jersey. He's deceased now, but the Gonsfeld studies where there was this idea of putting people into this state of um, Gonsfeld, which was basically a deprivation of your sensory apparatus. You put like these ping pong balls over your eyes and you play white noise in the ears. And um, there's a person in another room who is watching video clips. And so there's the person in the Gonsfeld state in this non-sensory kind of sensory deprivation procedure. And you have another person in another room who at random times is um, through, at random intervals and also through a random selection of pictures is watching a video clip. And so they were able to do a statistical outcome on these Gonsfeld studies to look at the degree to which there was this kind of transpersonal empathy that could be measured using um, probability. And uh, in fact, the studies showed that you would expect on the basis of chance that a person would have an accurate description one in 25 times because there were four pictures that were chosen from uh, out of a much larger pool. And uh, what they found is about a 33% success rate with the average population. Uh, I did a study with Chuck Honerton using um, or working with a student population from the Juilliard School of the Performing Arts. And uh, we found a 50% success rate with them using this procedure. And uh, the classical musicians actually got a 75% success rate. So we, there's something about empathy as both physical and potentially non-physical and, um, and involves so many um, subtle aspects that it's always good, I think, to pull those apart. So you're saying, okay, we have mirror neurons, which, which is kind of, you're seeing someone or you're seeing, you know, a whole group of people and you're kind of, it's being mirrored in you kind of through this mirror neuron physiological level. And you're saying that there's another level of, of connection, which is, um, I mean, it's either kind of some sort of an energetic feeling, the energy with through physical, phys some sort of energy, or it's supernatural in terms of it, it transcends physical um, nature? I wouldn't say supernatural, but I would say transpersonal, um, where there does appear to be a body of data you know, that was actually originated back in the 1800s that has been developed under very rigorous circumstances that suggests that there can be this um, basis of these empathetic experiences that has yet to be understood by the five senses, the known five senses. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I think it's all of that. I think it's the mirror neurons and the direct transmission. I think there probably are, I mean, we know our bodies are electromagnetic field generators and that it has been documented that people's hearts can correlate in a central space based on just the natural degradation of an electromagnetic signal. You know, that's like physics. We can, we can document that very, very nicely. Um, you see it in the way that collective rituals unite and entrain people's brains so people get actually correlations in their physiological activity. What can you say about about that? That that would be more the uh, the uh, uh, mirrored empathy in the sense of I mean, the scientists call that emotional contagion uh -huh, in the right. sense that it's like you're seeing all this kind of going. And I see that in dance. I do kind of this freestyle dance, uh -huh. and I've you know kind of done you know different th activities where I mirror somebody what they're doing, and there's something happens where we kind of like, you know, at first it's kind of like awkward and something happens. There's almost like a click and it's almost like I already know where the person is going to go before they go there and they know where I'm going. Right. And we move in this really, it, it's almost like it's, it's almost like a, a third body conscious awareness. It's like, mm -hmm. it's not me and them. It's kind of like us conscious, you know, and a very highly attuned, uh, kind of a consciousness and, right. and the creativity is quite amazing because I'll like say oh let's try this movement and they're trying it and let's try this and it's it's uh, it's really a lot of fun I mean that's kind of like the real payoff of empathy for me is that that really that harmonic creative creativity that can kind of come out of it 
So, so what I'm saying is that there's an explanation for that that trance uh, kind of, and it seems to be it's that mirror neuron, unless there's something else you're saying. You're, you're yeah. seeing. Yeah, I would say I would say yes, it's definitely mirror neurons. That's one aspect of an explanation. But as a scientist, you're going to want to really look at the full spectrum of what's going on there. Is it simply the mirror neurons? And maybe in your instance, it is. I think there are actually biochemical changes that happen. So that's not just the mirror neuron mechanism, which is a specific pathway in the brain, right? right. So I think there are there are brain aspects of what's happening in empathy. There are these extended electromagnetic and potentially pheromone, you know, smell, hormone kind of things that happen at a, a, a little extended reach, you know, in uh -huh. the in the in the Eastern traditions, they would talk about these kind of subtle fields, and now we have kind of a um, a science that we can put behind those subtle fields, recognizing it as electromagnetic fields. Yes, I think that's beyond the mirror neurons in my in my thinking. And then you have that whole social contagion piece, which I think is also interesting, because we don't totally know if that's all about mirror neurons, what the biochemistry of that is. And then I do think that if you're gonna uh, environment, environment, and the uh, sort of what's going on in that space. Whether it's um, what was that? Ivan Illich said it's hard to be healthy in a sick society, and so all the ways in which the social institutions shape our worldview, shape the parameters in which we're able to operate. I think all those things sort of embed empathy. But well, there's even if I could jump in here, there's the. Uh... If we if we're in a in a you, you go into a different neighborhood and you can feel the energy that's kind of like the manifestation of the of of people's spirit right. in terms of how the houses are built the energy so there's almost we can kind of learn get something uh, feel empathize with the community by feeling the objects and there's there's a lot of work done around within the uh, design community in terms of we need to have empathy within design. Right. Uh, that makes <clears throat> a lot of sense. And art would be an expression of that. And so there's a bit of a, a remove there. So I just, in terms of thinking about like um, a mechanism or a continuum of mechanisms by yeah. which could bring a scientific lens to empathy. And then I just want to add this final one, which I think does get ignored, which is that there is this possibility of these extended non-sensory aspects of empathy. Certainly if you take at a direct phenomenological level people's reports of empathy, it often involves something beyond, it's like they no longer feel just themselves. They feel this unit of consciousness mm -hmm. that has a transpersonal quality to it. And I do believe there are data that certainly look compelling. Uh, the recent work by Daryl Bem, the stuff that Dean Radin's doing at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, um, where there are scientists that are actually attempting to document and understand empathy. So we're, see, we're, we're, we, we just had a break in the, in the, in the uh, connection. Um. So what I think is that we can consider um, science as a way of looking at the possible mechanisms of action in something like a construct called empathy. So from a scientific point of view, you want to understand both the parts of this thing as well as the whole. And so we have talked about a number of possible mechanisms. We were talking about the neurophysiological aspects of like mirror neurons seem to be an important aspect of how we uh, attribute intention to another person um, and how we feel them and how we model on them. And then we talked about like this idea that there could be this extended field of electromagnetic and, and um, olfactory, you know, chemical um, pheromone type of uh, mechanisms. And then we talked a bit about the cultural and that way in which you know, there's something bigger than just the you and I, it's embedded in a context. And so all of that begins to shape our understanding of empathy, our empathy for what? Is it just for another person? Is it, you know, for the relationship in a certain space and time? Um, and then we talked about, you know, the whole social structural piece of it. What are we being trained into in terms of empathy? And then I think what I was wanting to introduce there was, um, you, the idea of a transpersonal. And if you take at a phenomenological level, what do people report when they have these extreme experiences of empathy? It's this kind of unit of oneness. And the question becomes, can science address that piece as well? And, and you can say, okay, it's a psychological state, or it could be that there is something called, you know, 
telepathy, the transfer of empathy, uh, even beyond the known senses. And there are a whole body of data to support that. Uh, I think it adds some interesting dimension uh, and allows for us to move beyond a strict, strictly materialist, physicalist model for understanding empathy to one that involves a kind of transpersonal and humanistic perspective. So I like to hold the whole and think about it as a kind of integral model. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I like that approach as well. I, I uh, feel very eclectic in the way that I approach empathy. I, I like to look at from from the sciences, which is a bit of a stepping back, looking at the components and all that, but also from the felt uh, embodied experience of it, kind of looking at it, uh, like, what does it feel? What's the sensation? What's the reality that I'm kind of like operating from? And that's a little bit of what I was ex uh, mentioning about the dance as well. For me, the dance is all about that embodied uh, kind of a consciousness of, of empathy. So I I'm wondering, uh, as a felt experience in your body, if, you're, if you kind of look back through your experience, of having experienced uh, a deep level of empathy. What, yeah, taking a deep breath, kind of relaxing, you know, what did that, what was that experience and what did that feel like in your body? Uh, I think I'm a highly empathetic person actually. And so, and I, I was been thinking about it since I knew I was gonna do this, have this conversation with you. Um, I think sometimes it's very painful honestly. Uh, I think when you have that deep, profound, it can be joy. I mean, I know that there's that part of it, but one of your questions to me in advance was, you know, what limits our capacity to build this quality of our being? And I think the painfulness of it can be really uh, an important factor because when I feel overwhelmed by empathy, it's when I see suffering. Uh, when I see something even something really poignant that um, the reason I stopped watching television probably 25 years ago is I was finding myself to be just like programmed by these commercials. So like the little AT&T commercial where um, you have this grandson and the grandmother on other sides of the country and they drop the little pin and it goes poing and you. So you were, you were just talking about your own personal experience and it was about, um, about experiencing pain actually. Oh. I think it can be both. I think the, the phenomenology for me of deep empathy is both the desire to have that uh, recognition of sameness in a really fundamental way. And, and with that is a, um, a kind of non-dual state of consciousness where there doesn't feel to be separation, where there does feel to be deep unity. And, uh, and that's profound and beautiful. I, I can feel it in nature. Uh, I certainly, as a cultural anthropologist and having studied uh, in a number of places where I could be with the folk, um, I have always felt this profound, overwhelming sense of likeness. I, I work a lot with people from different traditions and cultures and um, even within our own culture, different worldviews about, you know, a lot of things, politics or value systems. And um, there's actually for me sometimes a profound sense of unity, empathy, empathy more than compassion. Um, when I'm with people where I start to see the common humanity, even in the face of the differences. So that's a profound sense of empathy for me that I can feel embodied about. Um, but what I you know, was starting to talk about before is I think a real barrier for us is that there are so many reasons and ways in which our separation is amplified in our culture. And um, it's often dangerous to be too connected and too empathetic. And, um, and then in particular, at the existential level of how I can feel the deep suffering and pain of another person, uh, that can be just overwhelming. So I can see that in our culture, there is a, a kind of defense mechanism that sort of shuts down uh, the empathy capacity quotient or whatever we might think about it as. And I think we have to grapple with that part of it when we're talking about uh, the cultivation of empathy and creating a more empathetic society is that, you know, until there's a tipping point and we have a maximum capacity of safeness, it's, it's very difficult to be overly empathetic if one wants to maintain their sense of boundedness. Yeah, it's, it's really that, that part about empathy and boundaries. It's like losing yourself 
And then how do I get myself back? And I, some people I've talked to, uh, they say, I don't want to do empathy. I've done empathy, you know, all my life. I need those boundaries. I need to learn those boundaries. And there's, uh, you know, that, that sense of maybe lostness within, within that deep empathy and, you know, where am I kind of, who am I? Yeah, so it seems like the safe thing is, and probably the uh, the balanced thing, really, I don't know, safe, it can, people's criteria can be different on that, but um, it's it's a balance. It's a balance between that sense of uh, recognizing your own individuation as a healthy unit in this world of living systems and knowing that there are boundaries on that, and then recognizing all these other dimensions that we've been talking about, the fact that we are part of a, a shared bioenergetic system, that we have these brains that are trained for one another and for um, visual and other kinds of sensory experiences, and that, you know, as a culture, that we are diverse in the same way a healthy habitat is. And so how do we find that sense of integration at the same time as we have that opportunity to be these, you know, autonomous units that think and feel and and are, you know, by our birthright something that is very creative. So you're still looking for that balance or it, uh, of how do you balance that individual and that uh and the uh, empathic connected quality. I guess. I mean, I think so. I look at it in different ways. I look at it in my own life. I look at it as a mom. You know, I look at it as an educator who is really taking forward this curriculum on worldview literacy. And uh, I think empathy is one dimension of what we should be exploring. And, you know, I think um, understanding communication for sure, um, you know, I think it's also really important that we understand what are the social parameters that influence us. I'm really fascinated by all the uh, social psychology and cognitive science work that's being done on attention and um, how our attention and our awareness towards something um, limits our capacity to see many other things. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the value systems that we hold actually determine whether we're able to activate the learning center or the warning center of our brains, uh, which can make learning new things very difficult. Uh, and so I find all of these aspects of how our um, body, mind, culture, society, and spirituality all kind of interconnect. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, it, that's kind of like a real interest is, is kind of the understanding of all those? Uh, qualities and how the mind and body actually work? Yeah, I uh, am very interested in sort of the development of our, you know, furthest reaches of our human potentials. And, and I see that by learning more about our attention and our intention, um, we can begin to sort of cultivate and, and better be aware of the fullness of our, you know, so we talk about the mirror neurons piece and, um, mm -hmm. There's a psychologist named Phil Zimbardo who's done some really brilliant work on how uh, society informs our choices about um, like mob behavior or gang behavior. And that you can, um, by watching, there's this way in which people can give up their own authority to the you know maladaptive behaviors of a collective and and so in that case he is inviting people to um, develop their heroic imagination our capacity not to move with the mob but to be individuated enough that we can and I don't think that that's different than having empathy um, but I think it's playing on this tension between the individual and the individual who feels so much for the group um, and then what is the nature of right action in that? And that goes to your fourth level of how are we actually taking this concept of empathy and applying it in the world? Yeah, well, uh, I, I talked to someone once about that mob uh, psychology and that mob psychology uh, it can be geared towards lack of empathy towards a minority. It's kind of like this typical fear, right? It's like, and then you get swept up and, you know, beating somebody up or demeaning somebody or, 
or hanging somebody. We're talking about, you know, the lynchings, perhaps, you know, African-American lynchings as kind of like an extreme or a mob psychology of Rwanda uh, where, you know, everybody's swept along. And so it's like, how do you stay grounded that when that mob psychology comes where it's like anti-empathic, anti-caring, that you say, no, we need, we need to think of everyone. We need to include everyone. We can't demean, put down uh, someone. But in that case, it could be that you're having a heightened empathy for the rest of the gang. And you, you have maybe not infinite empathy. Did I just hear something? You still there? Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> I'm here. Um, you know, so it's like, is empathy an all or nothing? Or is it something that maybe you can get those in-group empathies? So Phil Zimbardo, he did this classic experiment. Uh, it was called the Stanford Prison Project. And he uh, took undergrads and he simulated a prison environment in the basement of Stanford's psych department. And he uh, had, I think by random decision, you were like a warden. He was the warden. Um, you had the, the guards, the prison guards, or the inmates. And uh, they, they simulated this environment, lived in it. And they had to call the experiment off after a couple of days because the the students had so completely taken over the role playing and that it was actually really a frightening experience. And so, you know, he has a, a lot of experimental data to support the idea that, you know, I don't know whether he would call it empathy. He'd be an interesting person for you to interview. He's a fantastically interesting guy. Yeah, I talked to him once. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. But so empathy, is it an all or nothing? Is it only? For oh yeah, that's yeah. Is so you're saying is empathy like a switch? Is it an on or off switch, or is it? I like the the metaphor of the dimmer switch. That empathy is like this dimmer switch, and we keep can keep raising it just, and we get to the light. And maybe the top is like you know universal love or something, but uh, so it's. I'm kind of looking at how do we raise that that bar, right? That level. It's kind of goes in two directions because it's also about like what I was just saying there is how inclusive is your empathy, how full is your empathy, and then how inclusive is your empathy. So maybe you're you have two dimensions of your knob. <laughs> yeah, it could be multiple dimensions because we're we have empathy going in a lot of different directions, right? So I see it a little bit. Have you ever seen uh, sound levels uh, where they're kind of like bouncing like this. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then, so there's so many different facets of empathy going on at the same time. We want to raise the general level uh, of empathy. So it still has its, um, you know, fluctuations. And I mean, it seems like not being empathic in our uh, energy, you know, our awareness focusing, uh, you know, in fear or something, it's just a biological function. It served us well. So it's not like to put that down either. So can I ask you a question? Um, yeah. In all of this work that you've been doing, what is an experience that um, stands out for you in your interviews with people or an insight about empathy that um, you really felt resonated with the core of everything you're learning? Well, I think it was uh, some of the high points have been like that dance I was talking about where uh, I'd been to a workshop uh, where I just received a lot of empathy. I mean, a lot of people were listening and it, you have so many workshops there at ION. So you, you know the experience, right? You're flooded in all this, this uh, presence. And I found it was almost like an empathy battery. I felt like charged, you know, full of of this uh, centeredness. And then I went into this uh, dance that I do the next day. And I said, I'm going to really listen to people. I'm gonna, when I dance, I'm here, I'm gonna be very present. And I'm like consciously saying, I wanna hear uh, what you have to say, but I wanna hear it at a, at a energetic level. And so I'm gonna mirror whatever you're doing. I'm going to mirror what you're doing. And you know, people would be moving like really fast and then uh, I would mirror and sometimes I would kind of struggle, you know, with the mirroring. I wouldn't get it. I wouldn't like really get. And then they would actually see that I'm mirror, trying to mirror them and they would slow down so I could get them. So I could really feel energetically mirror, uh, you know, what they were, what the energy that they had and the movements that they were doing. And then it was almost like, uh, you know, gears clicking in where it's like suddenly we become like this one 
consciousness. Mm. And within that one consciousness, we're moving at, I mean, super fast. I mean, this is like, you know, freestyle dance and the movements are just so fast and, you know, we're turning and twisting and tumbling and what have you. But I already know where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And it's the same way. So it's just, just this smooth har harmony as well as creativity. It's like the shared creativity where it's like I say, oh, try this energetic movement and they'll try it and then they'll add something on top of it. You know, and then I'll add something on top of that. So it's just very intoxicating, you know, kind of an experience. So uh, that's kind of like one high point. And, and the other one is making love, right? For me, it's like, you know, that physical, you know, the your eyes are kind of closed. You know, I mean, it's the dark or whatever. And there's that deep kind of connection with the spirit and soul of someone else. And you're kind of like exploring each other's, you know, being and consciousness. So that's, that's kind of like another kind of a peak emp empathy experience. Hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. So you're very uh, embodied in your notion of um, empathy. It's very physical for you. Uh, very much. I, I kind of am very eclectic. So uh -huh. I, I like that part. I like talking to actors uh -huh. who, you know, I mean, actors and artists and, and who are, for me, are kind of the people who are really into the embodied part as well as the academics. So I like to jump between the two uh -huh. and, and uh, there's a, a video of uh, Ramachandran, V. Ramachandran. And he, he, uh, he, has a, he had a slide and he showed the humanities and science uh, kind of like shaking hands through empathy. Mm -hmm. That empathy was the, was the mechanism through which the, the humanities and that experience was connecting to uh, science in, in the sense that it's showing that the art, the art and science are really connected through this empath empathy uh, um, quality. So I was on a program with him recently down at uh, Deepak Chopra's Sages and Scientists Conference, and uh, he was talking about mirror neurons and the whole way in which now people can have this sensation, a physical sensation, uh, by seeing something, and then it's. Um, then you t you remove the actual limb and you scratch the surface of the table and people are still feeling it. Uh, so that sense of consciousness as beyond our simple embodiment, you know, and how the mind body comes into that. He's a brilliant guy. Yeah, I really have enjoyed his work a lot. Um, how about Ashoka? How are you connected to all of that? And um, I'm impressed by this whole initiative that they're doing around empathy and excited about it and happy to be participating with our Worldview Literacy Project, hoping to... Um, you know, get a little further along in the conversation. Yeah. Um, I've interviewed Mary Gordon, who's uh, one of the fellows on Ashoka, not fellows, but she's a fellow as well as on the board of directors. And, you know, Bill Drayton has kind of been talking about empathy for quite a while. And it seems like they've kind of come to the awareness of empathy as being the central value that at this point in time in history is something that we need to kind of work on and uh, promote in the schools and, and wider. So, um, so I've kind of been connected there and they have on that contest, they have like what they call expert commentators. So I'm one of the commentators been just going and talking to different, uh, uh, you know, different groups and people that have uh, submitted proposals, you know, for their competition. Right. So, and I'm hoping to do more with them because it, it, I think they have the clout, you know, I, I've been working here out of my home office and, you know, have, and uh, so they have a huge network of, you know, social entrepreneurs. They can really, I think, really do a lot to raise that whole awareness of empathy. So do you know how many uh, applications they got for the uh, empathy award? Um, yeah, I think they have over 300 now. Wow. That's yeah. good. That's nurturing the field and getting people to think about it. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think you were a reviewer for us or you were one of the commentators. That's yeah. how we met. Uh, on the Ashoka website, or what's the, what's the name of the the link there? Uh, there's is empathy.ashoka.org. Right, right. 
So, so yeah, so we're very happy to participate in that. The Worldview Literacy Project, I think, is something that um, speaks to how we bring these skills and qualities into the future, which is working with our youth, you know, being part of the educational system. Uh, we also have a program at the Institute of Noetic Sciences on conscious aging, where we look at uh, issues of worldview uh, through the lens of uh, our own process of death and dying. And then um, I have a movie project that I'm working on with Deepak Chopra right now called Death Makes Life Possible. And it's really about cultivating for people a sense of um, understanding around death from different cultural perspectives. Uh, we then go into talking about what are the cosmologies of the afterlife? How do people um, hold different models of what happens after we die and then how do you bring an evidence-based perspective to that so we've got scientists and we have people who've had these experiences of profound oneness empathy um, transpersonal that talk about experiences of having been dead or near death and uh, and then finally we talk about the kind of psychological and sociological healing that comes when we make um, make peace with this idea of our own mortality and mm. and that sense of uh, interconnected whole again. So there's lots of really fun projects that are going on at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and I'm actually really appreciative of the uh, empathy perspective. We also are participating in a grant that came out of uh, the Center for Greater Good on um, uh, uh, gratefulness and that is a practice for how you know living in a grateful um, way and cultivating those capacities of gratitude uh, they're very linked to empathy it's all kind of a constellation of qualities that um, you know just cultivating any one of them would make us probably a lot better as as it relates to the whole so so I appreciate what you're doing very very much Okay, uh, great. No, I appreciate your uh, taking the time to, uh, you know, talk with me and kind of explore this theme of empathy. And I hope we can uh, continue the, I think the empathy movement, you know, is kind of like just starting to get rolling. And, um, you know, I hope we can perhaps work in, in other ways together. Uh, we're doing, you know, some panel discussions and uh, other kind of projects like that, you know, doing a conference. I'd look to that. That'd be fun. Include me in any and all of it. It sounds like a lot of fun. And yeah, I think, you know, the Institute of Neurotic Sciences has really been about the connection between these inner experiences um, and then the, the, you know, the discipline of how we help legitimize some of this using science. And so to the extent that we can be an ally to you as you're developing your work and and also just personally, I'm um, deeply passionate about how we bring these ideas into the world. And and so I'm grateful to you. I loved your website, loved all the stuff you had going on there. And I thought, wow, it's amazing what the world offers to us. So thank you for- oh, Great, thank you so much for those comments. So, okay. Okay, so we'll be in touch then. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.